people drive through here typically on their way to Big Bend. Don't even think about stopping here because they don't think there's anything here. But if you kind of go off the highways, then you start to kind of see more of the dramatic landscape and that the idea that there's possibly, you know, religious narratives just sitting in these rock shelters out here, most people don't have any idea and that's really cool. People don't know that this art is here. And even to the people that do know it's here, we know relatively little about it. Today, we are in a beautiful rock shelter just right off the Pecos River. We did a lot of driving and hiking to get here. It is a, a really incredible site. This one is a really large site. It was inhabited. They also painted the walls behind us. Closer to the, the bottoms of the rivers, flooding is a big concern. There are several sites along the Rio Grande that are underwater now, but then just kind of periodic rains. Some of those canyons will flood, will flash flood, and sites will go underwater. The art itself is degrading really rapidly, but in the last 50 years or so, they've been degrading even more rapidly than ever before. And that's largely because of, of changes that we as humans have made to the landscape. So the Alexandria Project is a four-year project that we launched in 2017 to try to baseline document over 300 murals in a four-year period. This art is not only incredibly unique across the world, but we've also discovered that we can understand it. We are learning to decipher it. So we've kind of realized, you know, there's 300, so if you lose one to some flooding, that's not that big a deal, we've lost it. We've discovered that it's more like a library, where you, you have a, a group of books, and each of those books tells a different story. And if you lose one, then you lose that story. So that sort of ramped up our motivation to get these documented as quickly as possible. Baseline documentation really, at its core, is just highly, highly intensive photographic documentation. Our two main methods are making 3D models out of overlapping photographs. And then we also do what are called giga panoramas. And that's stitching together really high resolution photographs to make these panoramas that we can then take back in the lab and enhance and, and pull out different colors and really make the art really visible. In addition to the really intensive photographic documentation, we're taking copious notes. So it's tons of narrative descriptions of the types of symbols that we're seeing, the types of patterns that we're recognizing. Sometimes we may say, oh my gosh, this is just like what we saw at a site two canyons over. Or we may say like, whoa, we've never seen anything like this before. Both of those things have happened at this site. Man, this is weird. Things kind of repeat over and over again. We see them in very similar locations on figures, these attributes aren't just there as decorations, they're placed there intentionally. They're clues for us to be able to kind of continue to follow to see if we can eventually figure out who these beings are or what's being depicted. Our oldest radiocarbon date is 4,000 years old, and our youngest for this style is about 1,000 years old. 3,000 years is a really long period of time 
for a group of people, particularly hunter-gatherers, to produce the same type and style of art in the same way. Here where this Pecos River, the Devils, and the Rio Grande come together, it's kind of 8,000 square miles, that they would come here and just here. This art is just here. Perhaps they came here on purpose, maybe they put it here on purpose, you know, as they had wide ranges and they were trading and they were talking with other groups, but they gathered here to, to build those social bonds, to share that information. It's clear that this art had a big part to play in that culture. Here's that giant power bundle that's kind of centralized at this site. And what these images allow us to do is we can zoom in. And this is very high off the wall, so we couldn't, do that. We couldn't get up to that to even look at it. But this allows us to even look, you know, meters high off the wall and zoom in and see the individual splatter paint and when they were flicking their brush, which is, it's amazing. From there, you can also see the entire center portion of it is very intricately done. It's not just a solid line. It's, it's actually made up of hundreds of individual lines or brush strokes. So once we get this image, we want to run it through our D-stretch. It allows us to see stuff that is barely visible to the human eye. Yeah, so you can barely make them out in the real color image, but D-stretch allows us to see quite a bit more. We can see it's center styled and it's actually painted in two different colors. Ah, you can even see the little teeny uh, digits on the hand. <laughs> naturalist or whatever term you want to label it we're all borrowing you know it just happens to be under our control mm -hmm. today but we're just borrowing it from one generation to another and so at the end of the day we've got to leave it in better shape than the way we found it whether or not this rock art lasts. Sometimes it's, it's hard to compare that and, and call it a problem. The, the thing is, you don't realize that it was important until maybe after it's gone. And if, if we were to just, you know, stop what we're doing, you know, if we'd never existed, and these sites just degraded and continued to flood, and, you know, in 300 years we have five left, and then somebody was like, why didn't we save these? It's really high on our hearts because we watch them go away every day. We see that degradation every day. And there's something we can do about it. <laughs>